Welcome, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. And uh, I'm Paola Corti, the Open Education Community Manager at Spark Europe. And I work with uh, librarians in the European network of open education librarians. Uh, our librarians uh, have organized this webinar. This is the first webinar uh, workshop in a series. Uh, the, the name of the series is Embrace the Open, and the title of this uh, first workshop in the row is uh, An Introduction to Open Textbooks. Um, we will have three workshops uh, focusing on open textbooks uh, and uh, the facilitators in the room accompanying us uh, through this learning experience are uh, Silvia Moes from the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Mira Baust Zuck from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and Lambert Eller from the Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology in Germany. And uh, I'm happy to have you, and the floor is yours. Yes, welcome also from my side. I find it super exciting that there's such a big interest in uh, all matters um, open textbooks. And uh, let me give you a very quick overview on what we want to cover in the first hour of this event. So we will give you a quick introduction uh, what what are we talking about when we uh, mention open textbooks? Then, as you know, textbooks are all about didactics, about having learning and an audience in mind. So what does integration and learning design mean? And uh, then we want to give you very concrete examples. Uh, so best practices from open textbook publishing. And uh, last but not least, we want to discuss some challenges and opportunities ahead because this is a very young field of activity, or at least it feels so in Germany. The Netherlands are uh, far ahead as, as it feels. And in the last half hour of this event, we will also give you the opportunity. So I will come back and uh, guide you through a discussion. And uh, if you have any types or the kind of ideas or questions, don't hesitate, put them already in the chat. I will try to uh, keep the overview of this. Next slide, please. Sorry, I don't, I can't, yeah, thanks, thanks. So, and uh, the, our goal is that um, by the end of the first workshop of these three workshops, you will at least understand what open textbooks are and what are the speci specific benefits of them. And also to identify the opportunities for integrating them in what happens as learning or open learning in your university, in your institution, and in your library. And uh, we also want to make sure that you understand the current landscape of open textbook publishing practices, at least in several leading institutions in this regard. And we want you also to reflect on the challenges and opportunities from open textbooks. Thank you a lot. Yeah, and here's the first question for you. Uh, may, maybe you can type this into your, uh, oh, okay, ha, ah, Mira already posted in, in the chat. So you just need to click the link. Just give us a hint. What are you? Are you a librarian? Are you a professor? Are you a developer or whatever, or a learner? So what mostly fits your role so that we can have a nice uh, little overview. And so that we, the speakers, know who we talk to. Very convenient. Uh, yeah, you can you can put it in the chat, but best is you click uh, the uh, the link that Mira gave you in the chat and put it there. So we'll roll. Thanks. Thanks. And I will share the answers uh, right away. Just a second. Yeah. Give us a minute. Mm -hmm. Are you all finished with filling in your term? Let's try it. Maybe, maybe most of us are already there. 
Our many librarians here, beautiful, as you would expect, because we are all about uh, open educational practices in libraries, but it's not only librarians, as it seems. So I can also see software developer, and uh, I see teacher, I see part of the course, and still more publisher, university publisher. You can read the rest. Wonderful. Th th thanks a lot for the feedback. So I guess we are done with that. Uh, and uh, now I give over to uh, Mira. Yes, thank you, Lambert. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Let's flip to the next slide and the next part. Uh, so before diving deeper um, into discussing the didactics and pedagogical approaches connected to integrating open textbooks into your curriculum, uh, let's actually take a look at what they are and what can we do with them and why are we even discussing uh, the topic of open textbooks. Um, so open textbooks, uh, of course, are familiar to many of you, especially if you are uh, familiar with the, the concept of open educational resources or OER. Open textbooks are usually uh, one of the most recognizable uh, forms of OER, and they are, of course, a part of a broader open education movement. Um, so open textbooks uh, are there to make education more accessible, also more affordable to students, but also to society in general. We can look at it from a broad perspective. They also facilitate a more free exchange of knowledge among experts. So they also serve to valorize the knowledge, valorize the research output, if you will, um, and make teaching materials easier to adapt to the needs of the classroom, to the needs of your students, to the learning design you have in mind as a teacher, to the curriculum you, you have as an institution. Open textbooks can also be highly instrumental in engaging students uh, through designing interesting learning assignments. So due to their open nature and due to the affordances that are uh, well uh, represented by the Creative Commons or any other open license. Uh, so an open textbook is uh, a textbook or a collection of materials that is free to use, reuse, um, adopt, adapt, um, mix, remix, depending on the provisions of a particular license. So just a general view and open textbooks come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, we shouldn't think of uh, just traditional textbooks uh, that we know of, the printed old school textbooks. Uh, they could be so much more than that. Um, they could be different varieties of interactive moments uh, put together, all sorts of learning assignments, and they answer different learning goals and learning needs and course designs. What's the context um, that we place this topic in? It's also important to understand a bit broader the open education movement and uh, what the open textbooks are the answer to. So the movement mainly originated in North America, in the US and in Canada, uh, where textbooks are uh, usually generally far too expensive. So students would spend between, I don't know, $350 uh, dollars in Canada and up to $600, $1,000 in the US per year on their um, well, um, learning materials on the textbooks. Uh, there's also quite a large income gap between different uh, students, different groups of students. And uh, this all um, well, uh, resulted in the zero textbook cost or ZTC movement that's uh, gaining momentum or is quite uh, developed already in the US and in Canada. And you can also see at the graph uh, here on the slide um, how much, uh, yeah, what, how the inflac inflation in affected uh, the price of college textbooks. So compared to the consumer price index that you see as the lower line on the graph, the uh, college textbook costs have risen dramatically, exponentially, and uh, completely uh, not in line with the rising of the rest of the prices um, in, in, in the economy. So most of this is based on the US data, but you can get the, the general uh, trends, the general uh, statistics. So as the answer to this, uh, the zero textbook cost movement emerged or the open textbook cost movement as, as well. And um, it's facilitated by the federal, state and institutional grants in many cases, but also by promoting um, or switching to open, to OER, to open textbooks in the rewards and recognition uh, of the faculty, in the faculty professional development. So in many European countries, switching back to our continent, because I assume most of us are from Europe, uh, this issue is manifested slightly differently uh, than across uh, the pond, across the, the ocean. And um, 
the problem we uh, mostly uh, face is uh, visible in the purchase of educational collections by our institutions, by our libraries. Uh, they are more and more unaffordable for many libraries to purchase. The license fees are quite high and also quite restrictive in terms of simultaneous users allowed to access uh, this or that textbook, in terms of uh, the uh, conditions that or uh, users per year that every library is allowed to, to show uh, or to, to loan an ebook to. So the licenses are getting more restrictive. The libraries in many cases are uh, losing the, the bargaining power while the, while the commercial publishers are very often, um, well, gaining that power. And that also resulted in this uh, quite widespread and well-known ebook sauce campaign that many of you have heard of or have even been a part of. Uh, so this is also a trendy topic happening in uh, more than one country uh, in Europe. And uh, teachers and students have therefore less visibility and less participation in the, in the content they use for their classes. So this is to sketch the, the, uh, the landscape in which we are discussing the topic of open textbooks here. Oh. Now, we would like to know what you think, and we would start with this question. Do you think that commercial textbooks are better of higher quality than open textbooks? What do you think? Um, could you please, uh, Paola, could you please start the poll? I don't think I have the, the option here. Yes, thank you so much. Could you please submit your answers here in the Zoom poll? Do you agree that commercial or traditional textbooks uh, that we normally would purchase for our uh, studying or teaching purposes are of higher quality than open textbooks? And the options are, yes, I think I agree commercial are better. No, I think open are better, uh, or they are of uh, equal quality, equally good or equally bad, if you believe so. So please submit your responses. Okay, we see that 29 people have submitted their responses. Any other thoughts? Okay, I will give you a few more seconds and if there are no more responses, we'll just uh, show the poll results. Okay, let's end the poll and see what we have here. So hopefully you can see the results on the screen. Right? And most of you, 86% or 25 people out of 29, think that they are equally good. Both uh, OER or open textbooks and commercial textbooks are equally good. Um, some of you, 10%, three, uh, three people, three persons, uh, think that commercial textbooks are better, are, have a higher quality. And one person, um, representing 3% of our audience who responded thinks that open textbooks are better. So a very interesting result. Um, thanks for sharing with us. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Paula. And why are we even asking you this? Um, well, we hope this would be a bit provocative to some extent and also showcase the, the, the belief or the myth uh, that also exists out there that, um, well, open or free means necessarily low quality and is always worse than another alternative, a commercial alternative. Well, it's not always the case. And to, uh, yeah, to support that, uh, there are also results of this study, empirical study, that spans um, over 46,000 students, where they were comparing uh, the open educational resources with traditional or commercial materials as college textbook choices. And in this case, uh, open educational resources mostly refer to open textbooks, of course. Uh, so the, this was a, a quite a large uh, research conducted by John Hilton III. And some of the findings are quite interesting and hopefully to some extent at least dispel the myth that open is necessarily uh, worse than, than commercial or than traditional. So according to the study, and you have the links to it in the slides, you can later click on it and read deep or watch a video presenting the results. According to the study, students generally achieve the same learning outcomes 
when OER are utilized, when open textbooks are utilized, as they would achieve with commercial or traditional textbooks. At the same time, uh, they simultaneously save quite large amounts of money, as we also saw in the previous slides, uh, how much, um, yeah, how much the, the textbook uh, prices have risen and how much the students would pay for them. Uh, the perception of the students and the, the teaching staff, the faculty, is that they are both generally positive about OER and about open textbooks, according to several studies. Uh, and most studies say that OER, open textbooks, are of similar or sometimes better quality. Uh, but unlike commercial textbooks that are often restricted by copyright provisions, copyright restrictions, um, open textbooks are also flexible and allow for more flexibility in a course. One of the studies even uh, concluded that students with OER have, uh, who used open textbooks for their studies have even had higher test scores, lower failure rates, and lower dropout rates. But of course, there were also some several other studies that uh, were more neutral about these conclusions, so we have to look at it more generally. And there's also other research uh, that didn't, uh, that wasn't included into this article, for instance, that shows that OER adoption uh, compared to using traditional resources can even increase student performance based on what you measure by uh, the term student performance. So hopefully, um, well, uh, these facts, uh, this research uh, numbers and results have at least uh, somehow persuaded you um, to try or to look into the direction of open uh, open textbooks and into their uh, overall uh, usability and quality. Uh, so open doesn't need to be, doesn't necessarily mean low quality, free doesn't necessarily mean low quality. Now, what issues uh, does educational literature have? Uh, usually, uh, we talk about the traditional or commercial, commercially published educational literature. Usually, uh, the textbooks are limitedly and, uh, and delivered and uh, with some delays. So some students do not have access to them from day one or day zero of the classroom. Um, and that affects and might affect their learning outcome and their future learning success. There's also very limited possibility of use and reuse both inside, but even more so outside the classroom. So talk about lifelong learning, for instance, or revising the results or some information after you've finished uh, one particular class. Well, commercial textbooks are usually in the way of that and due to copyright restrictions, that is not always possible. In most cases, it's not possible. Well, it's also difficult, difficult to align um, the sort of static commercial textbook with the educational goals and needs of a particular course. And very often, um, in many cases, although not in all, of course, the learning outcomes are dictated by what's available, by the material available, so by the, the, the textbook structure, instead of by the needs and learning goals of the students themselves and the learning design that every teacher wants to implement in their classroom. And of course, there are also poor agreements between publishers and authors, when authors sometimes unwillingly transfer all the rights to the publishers. And then we come across situations that we have, uh, for instance, faced at my university and at several others, that uh, the teachers uh, who are the authors of a textbook commercially published cannot use the same textbook in their class because our library, for instance, cannot purchase the license uh, for that book because it's unaffordable or uh, does not fit the budget, the existing budget. So you end up in a very precarious situation in this case. These are the issues that we're dealing with. Now, how could open textbooks be the answers uh, to these issues? How, what opportunities do they afford? First of all, teachers can publish their own teaching materials uh, so in this way, you can be recognized and rewarded for your educational excellence and for the well, research or educational output you've developed. Think of it as the valorization of, of, your, uh, of knowledge, of your research output, for instance. Teaching materials uh, that are open, that are open textbooks, usually better match the lesson design and the learning objectives and are flexible enough to be adjusted. The students can also access course material at any time, both before the class, during the class, but also after the class. And for many of, of us, for many of our countries, lifelong learning is a big goal that we're trying to build towards and work towards, and open um, contributes to uh, enabling the lifelong learning. The institution that uses uh, open textbooks, open educational resources, and produces them, showcases them, can showcase its area of expertise. The teacher can also showcase its area of uh, their area of expertise and broaden the outreach that their materials have by sharing them in the open, by developing them as open materials, as open textbooks. And well, an own. Uh, 
developed open textbook can also offer the instructor the space for more educational innovation and for more teaching activities to engage the class with. So these are the opportunities that uh, open textbooks uh, bring with themselves and hopefully uh, well they um, ignited some ideas and some new applications in your mind as well. Now I would like to give the floor to Sylvia, to our colleague Sylvia, who will go deeper into didactics and integration into learning design. Sylvia, you're muted. Excuse me. Yes, thank you so much. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, what Mira was talking about, about more um, possibilities to um, activate students in your classroom. Here you see one of the examples of that. Um, in this example, in a medical field of uh, school of trades and technologies in uh, medicine head college, the teachers were working together with students um, to create an open textbook. So the teacher started with an open textbook, but because the, of the insight in science are moving forward so rapidly, the students have to do some research on the newest insights and write one chapter about it in this open textbook. And they also have to create a video of two minutes, how they did their research and what their outcomes were. And what so nice is about these platforms, platforms is that a teacher first can let students create content, look at it and then publish it while the existing URL is not changing. So you see that it's much more flexible than a textbook from a publish, publisher because that's easily not, not uh, so easily to uh, achieve in this area. So this is just one of the uh, examples how you can activate your students and co-create together with them. If I may have the next slide. And all of that, you can base it on Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and what we did in the acceleration plan in the Netherlands is to see, okay, okay, what kind of elements can you create in open textbook to uh, connect them to learning activities from lower to higher order learning goals. And of course, writing a chapter in an open textbook is one of the highest open, uh, um, one of the highest learning goals, namely creating. And before you can create information, you first have to fully understand it and have a discussion with peers on that before you work together and produce something. So you see that you go through all the levels and that you maximize the outcome, the learning outcome of the students. And we, when you do it like this and you ask students three months after the exam what they remember of it, it's much more than for example, you let them fill in a multiple choice question or so. So we create a wheel of insight and uh, different types of learning materials, 3D, audio, video, text, um, what do we have more VR are connected by uh, publications, how they connect to the Bloom's taxonomy and it's the Bloom's revised, revised uh, um, taxonomy. Um, the URL to it is in, uh, is in the slide, the slides will be shared. And this uh, wheel is also translated, translated in English. So you can have a look on it, but it shows you how you can work with different types of content into your open textbook, because textbook is not, of course, only text. It can be different kinds of um, yeah, media in, integrated in it. So if you go to the next slide, um, then you see here some interaction with content. And there I give the floor to Lambert for that one. Yes, thank you, Sylvia. So we just want to highlight that there are already um, publishing environments for online books where you allow or invite your readers to give directly feedback. This can be both feedback that is handled within a limited classroom, but also open or open to the authors. 
And uh, if you feel like, okay, this is very special to publish in that environment, then please have a look at Hypothesis. This is a very neat online service. So the URL is hypothesis.is, like the word, hypothesis. And um, so it's an open source approach following open web standards. And you can plug it into your existing web documents whatsoever in whatsoever format. We use it, for instance, in our open science training handbook four years ago. And you have all the ways of sharing uh, notes and questions from the readers within the classroom in public or with the authors. Just to mention all of these options that we have today already. And with this, I give back to Sylvia. Yes. And this slide is about um, when you have an intake with teachers about the integration of an open textbook in um, education, then we collected and we as Michiel de Jong from Technical University Delft and, and myself is that you can ask a couple of questions before you create can create an open textbook, then you have the focus of what you want and how you want it and how the textbook is playing a role in, in your educational uh, design. So you first start, what are the learning objectives in your, on your subject? And what kind of learning activities do you have with this? And how is it based from lower to higher order learning goals? And then you can use the, the wheel of insight to see, okay, how can I activate students with on which type of learning activities on which level? And then that is giving you information about the functionalities you need for an open textbook. And then you can match which platform is matching the best uh, functionalities. But also an important question is how many authors have to work together to create that open textbook? For example, I will show you this later on. One of our biggest textbooks of 700 pages is created by 65 authors. authors. So you will have a, need a platform where you can easily see all the newest uh, releases of con parts of content, but also are able to give people entrance to that platform. But also how are the students using that? open textbook how is it integrated into your course design do you only want to have a pdf with a second screen next to it for the interactive elements does it need to be modular because you want to do you want to integrate it into assignments in the learning environment what kind of output formats do you want to have and then you only want to manage one open textbook and not three or four versions because of other output formats. So, and when it is a big amount of pages, students read more, more easy from paper when it's a lot about a lot of paper. So then you have to give them the possibility to print it out so they can decide from themselves which pages I want to print it out and how much and how can I interact with the content as well. So these are giveaways from our insight, what we learned from it by the intake to uh, be aware of in making decisions and to start integrating it into the learning design. And for that process to support people in that process, we also developed a guiding tool, how to create open textbooks. So the questions you just saw were a couple of questions you came across when you start with an intake, but then it's only the intake and then you have to start to create an open textbook. So we published uh, first an open an, an guidebook, how to uh, create open textbook for librarians. That first was only in Dutch. Then we made the next the second version of that, extended it what, translated it into English, but at the same time, there was a lot of information. So we also extract information for the authors so that you have a small overview 
for the authors which steps you have to go through to create an open textbook. You see it on the right. And the party on the left is for the support staff to, to support the, the authors on who are doing the work on, on the subject. But the, the things on the left side are activities you came across to, um, yeah, to, to go through all the steps to publish your open textbook and also to uh, refresh it and all kinds of things in new editions. If we go to the next slide, then you see one of the open textbook I was talking about, one with 65 authors, that is on ecotoxicology. And this was funded by the Ministry of, the, of uh, Education in the Netherlands. And um, we worked together with five, um, with five other institutions to create this textbook. And it is now hosted um, on um, that it's being actual all the time. So it's it will be refreshed um, every year with new information, new insight. And it's on CTEC, uh, a community of uh, toxicologists. So by creating such a textbook with so many people, it's a lot of work, but also the benefits of it it's totally integrated in a lot of courses at the same time, because all the all the persons collaborate together to share their insight and integrate it into the course design. On the right side, you see how easily it was to give people uh, the access to it and uh, some metadata standards to say, okay, what is this textbook about and how can I share it uh, on platform platforms? And this platform is called uh, Wikiwijs Maken. It is a free a uh, free platform um, only in Dutch, uh, Dutch available at this moment, yes. And um, from the metadata and uh, creating a URL by publishing, we can um, uh, make it searchable for edu sources, a national platform for uh, open educational resources as well uh, in Melo. And via Melo, it ends up in all kinds of other open textbooks platforms automatically. And here I will uh, take over and uh, tell you about the examples or uh, the platforms we use at my university, the University of Groningen. Well, first of all, um, we implement this project together with the University of Groningen Press, the UGP, that also is structurally part of the library. and. Um, when we started um, thinking, considering starting the open textbook pilot, we thought that we would rely on the what we already know, what we already have experience with, namely the open monograph press, uh, because the UGP, the University of Groningen Press, has been active in publishing open access monographs before the textbooks. That was where they uh, or we gained a lot of experience in open access publishing. Um, and uh, Open Monograph Press is a, is a wonderful platform indeed. It's open access, it's uh, community driven, community based, and many institutions across the world actually use it for publishing their uh, monographs, for publishing their books. Uh, but we saw uh, talking to the first incoming teachers who came to us with their ideas for open textbooks, we saw that we needed more and we needed more interactivity we needed more um uh, yeah embeddedness of interactive content uh we needed more participation and co-creation for students and teachers so we went out looking and we uh for now stopped uh, on uh stopped at our choice with the uh, Pressbooks publishing platform. So at the moment we use both, depending on the needs of the teachers and the ideas they have behind the textbook they want to publish, and also depending on how much the students um, are to be involved. Because for instance, um, when working with Pressbooks, uh, what um, Lambert has already mentioned, you can also use the web annotation tools, for instance, Hypothesis or any other of your choice you have more wiggle room in that regard. You can also make it more interactive. Uh, so one of the platforms uh, we chose was Pressbooks. And this is the combination of two platforms we use at our university. Sylvia, I will pass the floor to you. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, um, at the, our university at this moment, we have 37 textbooks in all different types and, for, and, and, and from very small, from very small subjects to the biggest one of 700 pages. And they are mostly 
written for students to help them in education, but we have also one helping other teachers. That's for street law. So there is a, a book published for uh, teachers who is who are giving. Um, we are busy with education in street law, and then uh, an open textbook is published with all kinds of formats, rubrics, questionnaires, um, ideas how to make street law work in education. So that's one of the other um, examples. You see it here on, on, on the screen as well. And what we also have is um, some um, very high quality uh, books of Jochen Bretzneider. He is uh, working serious on creating beautiful books, but he's doing that in I iBooks author. Um, so he used very high end uh, graphics, interactive quizzes, interactive animations on cer certain topics on, um, on medicine in the, in the field of medicine. And on the right side, you see an example of a very small textbook. And this teacher worked very hard to produce 28 open textbooks in a period of one year. So it was really, she was going so fast with it and have so much joy. She said, Vicky Weismaker, it helps me. Said, it's so easy. What I have, I can produce it there. And she did go. So, and it's very nice to see how everyone is happy and inspired by that as, as well as the students. Um, yeah, what I said, this um, toxicology uh, te textbook is peer reviewed by 65 authors and you see um, there are six uh, chapters and each chapter is published by itself. So it's fully flexible. And when you have an account on Wikiweismaker, you can adapt uh, arrangement, a chapter is an arrangement and uh, it's all by CC license and uh, the, op the most open CC license to uh, edit the text and, and, and to change it. And here you see some, um, some insight that you can add graph, graphs to it, but also formulas. So it works very well and, and very easy. And you can give your own design because it was for uh, more institutions. So there was a uh, designer who made that um, the way it looks now. So you can also give your institutional um, uh, logos there and the colors and um, Everyone is using the same um, the same format for it. Yes, and here you see some of the authors. There's a long list there, so the URL is given in the slides, and you can then you can have a look for yourself how it looks like. And every chapter start with learning outcomes. So in this chapter you learn this, this, and that, and every chapter is is closed by three self questions to test your knowledge on. The, the topics in the chapter. And this is my part again. Uh, so now I would like you to reflect on the question, uh, well, shall we go for the web book, the interactive web, web book, or for the good old static PDF? Is one better than the other? Well, um, at the beginning of our own textbook journey, open textbook journey, we were also in this dichotomous mode of thinking, one or the other. But as we saw, with some incoming teachers and their ideas that they brought with them, sometimes it's both. <laughs> sometimes both are needed. And we're happy to accommodate uh, the teachers who would like to have both. They have their reason, reasons in many cases. Uh, for instance, uh, this was our first published open textbook of our university uh, by Andrea San Giacomo in philosophy. Uh, so he published his uh, lectures on global hermeneutics, the tragedy of self. Uh, and we published it both uh, as a web book uh, on uh, Pressbooks and also as an, a PDF, a static PDF uh, using the Open Monograph Press. Uh, and we are linking, interlinking to both um, to both uh, versions in each version, so that uh, depending on the reading experience students prefer, they could make the choice or well, goes beyond students, any reader prefers, because uh, this textbook, as we see, is also being downloaded 
uh, quite actively outside of the study time, so outside of the normal peaks of the semester, for instance. And we know that a broader community is also very much interested in reading it and using it. So that's uh, quite nice. And in this case, the author uh, wanted to first test the, 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 the textbook with students uh, in Pressbooks in this environment as the web book, collect their feedback, collect their response, process it, and then we'll publish it uh, also as a traditional um, or textbook. It's also available as print on demand version. So anyone who would like to have a printed version and doesn't want to print uh, in a good old way, uh, say from a printer, can also um, purchase order, um, yeah, just a hard copy or a soft copy, depending on the needs. But there are also authors who uh, want to go full in on one preferred mode um, of uh, showcasing uh, the textbook of interacting uh, with the students. And in this case, I'd like to show you this example uh, by our professor Christopher May. Uh, he's the professor at the University of uh, College of Groningen. And he published his uh, web book, Interdisciplinary Explor Explorations of Neuroscience, completely as a web book. And when asked, uh, Chris uh, admitted that he would not have wanted to publish it in any other way. So both open access um, as an open textbook and as an interactive web book. Uh, so this web book is indeed a web book. It, affords, uh, it offers lots of interactive opportunities, different types of exercises, embedded videos, images, uh, lots of opportunities to well, to deepen the the knowledge of the material, uh, but he what he also did is he used um, public annotation tools such as Hypothesis together with his students to collect uh, their views, their feedback, uh, to see if there are any bottlenecks or any um, well uh, red flags that he needs to elaborate more on. So basically, as we speak, Chris is finishing. Um, working on this textbook with his students, collecting their feedback, incorporating, and soon we will uh, actually finally publish it. It's already available on the internet, of course. Um, you will find the link uh, in the slides, but also, um, yeah, it's a work in progress. It's not a finished product yet. And uh, well, just as many open textbooks are, they are quite flexible and quite fluid in this regard. So you can very quickly return to them, improve on them, incorporate the needs of your next class, for instance, or of uh, informal peer review that you get from, from your community. Um, so this is a nice example to showcase. Now, we'd also like to uh, show what our colleagues at TU Delft are doing. Uh, they also have collected a whole uh, well, library, 26 titles of open textbooks. They're mostly um, PDF based, but uh, not all of them. So, uh, they, they use uh, different uh, publishing platforms. As far as I know, they use Open Monograph Press, but also Jupyter Notebooks. So they're also exploring and experimenting, and it's interesting uh, for you to take a look as well. And this is one of the examples of their textbooks here. But enough with the Netherlands, let's move out and let's go a bit further. Uh, this way, uh, in this case, we're going to Ukraine, all the way to Ukraine, to our colleagues from the Ukrainian State University of Science and Technologies. Uh, they are located in Dnipro, Ukraine. This is a frontline city, a very large city too. And uh, this university uh, has been our um, wonderful partner for many of us working together at the uh, NOL, European Network of Open Educational Librarians, that many of you are a part of, of course. And um, well, they are also active in the area of uh, open education, open educational resources, and namely and uh, primarily open textbooks. Um, so uh, the scientific library of this university uh, and the head of it is uh, Tetyana Kolesnikova, the director of the library. Um, they go a bit, uh, they both begin um, with small steps uh, approaching this topic. Um, not, uh, you know, not experimenting with maybe some high profile platforms or high tech solutions. Uh, they also produce uh, good old, um, you know, static PDF based textbooks. Uh, but for them, it is also a way to to start with open education and to engage their community and their students in the topic. And open textbooks for them are also representing access to education in times of high level crisis, in times of war that's ongoing in Ukraine. Um, Open textbooks also help them to take down the language barriers. Their university community is uh, very much in need of literature in the Ukrainian language. And open textbooks um, will provide um, and cover that need for them. They also help them ensure inclusivity and social justice for those students who are unable to, to study, to learn from traditional um, textbook sources or traditional materials. 
And the flexibility of open, of open materials, of open textbooks allows for that and allows for quicker adaptation of uh, localization of, uh, for instance, um, well, uh, English language textbooks that they could come across in their area of expertise. Uh, it's also a way for them to uh, participate in this international collaboration and be a part of international community working on this topic, well, teaching us, but also learning from us and exchanging this knowledge among each other, but also a way to profile their university, to build their university image through um, the open textbooks. And as of now, they have published eight open textbooks. Uh, most of them have been published in times of war, in times of the full-scale invasion by Russia. And um, before this workshop, I contacted Tatiana to uh, ask her uh, if she would like to send a message through this uh, slide and through you know, us describing their experiences, what would be the main um, sort of uh, takeaway she'd like us to uh, go away um, with? And she said that, well, um, basically, um, and this is my interpretation of Tatiana's words, but also a direct quote. Um, well, open textbooks are more than just teaching materials. As you see, for a university like Tatiana's, they represent uh, much more than that. They represent all sorts of ways to, um, yeah, to care for your community, to, to interact with your teachers, researchers, students that you're supporting as a librarian. Uh, but also for them, the open textbooks are their donation and their own contribution to, to victory, to, uh, well, to recovering, to being resilient. This is their way to donate their time and their effort because very often they are unpaid or quite low paid for what they do and they have to do it in the extra time, in the evening, during the weekend. Uh, so when you think of an open textbook, think deeper and beyond um, the material, the teaching material or the classroom, because it could be so much more as we see from their example. And I will give the floor to Lambert to go on to Germany. Thank you, Vera. We are pretty uh, advanced in our time frame, but I still I want to give you a few interesting examples of uh, successful open textbook projects coming from Germany. So uh, it's a very modest statement for someone who's working at TIB, but I must really say that TIB, our library in Hanover, uh, has a pretty strong footprint in open textbooks in Germany. So since a few years, we offer books friends which is a collaborative agile writing, writing process. And this is an approach where we help people who want to launch an open textbook to gather experts and to have them in one place for a few days. And in this time frame, to uh, from scratch, have them writing a, a small or larger textbook, in which case it might take several book sprints uh, together. And this is a very well proven method by now. Take for instance, the uh, open science training handbook that I mentioned earlier, when we talked about annotation tools. This is now five years old and by now it has received more than 70 citations according to uh, Google Scholar. It, is, uh, it has been translated by communities uh, with a fully finished translations more than four times and so on. And what you can also learn from the example of the Open Science Training Handbook is that we have this um, approach of um, uh, a semantic publishing pipeline. So we make sure that um, the book is uh, written in a structured way once, and then almost only with the click of a button can be produced into several target formats. So we stress this uh, uh, opportunity of having web books, but then, on the other hand, also PDFs, print-ready PDFs. And then there are also EPUBs, like you would find them on an Amazon Kindle on bookstore or something like that. And we can all produce this with a minimum effort. So the finished book is sitting on a Git repo, can be um, a living book that is uh, being uh, made better over time. And you can have uh, always a fresh version in all a target format as you want. So in this way, we did also a textbook series to mention just one more example with the Academy of Public Health, who does the education of public health officials in Germany on public health issues. And currently, this is maybe an interesting example. If you are in the presentation, give it a click here. IT in libraries, it's unfortunately a German book, but anyway, it's an ongoing project. So you can see what is already on there in the final uh, book website, but it's still uh, in production, so to say. 
And at tib.eu slash books, you find more on our approach, next gen books. And uh, I want to point out two other examples from beyond TIB, to be fair, because these are also uh, super interesting examples in their own regard, really highly recommended. The one is Open Reden. That's a, a, a book uh, or a number of books by now. Um, with a very uh, typical uh, science publisher, the Reuter publish uh, from legal scholars in Germany. And what I find so interesting about them is not only that these are Finnish books that are really out there, really being used heavily and so on, is that uh, I don't know about your country, but uh, within the humanities, legal scholars are somehow difficult when it comes to openness. So to have all of these open approaches it, I think it's a special uh, thing that they reach there, and it's super interesting to see how this works out. And one last example I want to give you. Um, so, of course, Open Revy, for instance, does not make use of uh, books. From, they have their own approaches, but so separately, but still definitely worth a look. And also, uh, one of the longest and most successful open textbook projects from Germany by far is Zerlu. They do textbooks also for not only in higher education, but by now also on uh, the um, basic education level on sciences uh, like mathematics and so on. And they have a very interesting approach in building up a um, contributor community. So if you want to learn how you make sure that people uh, can contribute to your open textbook project, you can maybe learn something from Zalo if you like those collaborative approaches as well. Uh, and maybe uh, into one or more of these uh, uh, examples, we will dive deeper into one of the upcoming the, one of the upcoming webinars here. Okay, so this is it for now from the German examples. Uh, and I give uh, back. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lambert. Uh, let's go to Canada now. Uh, so we'll take a look at a few examples that were developed or co-developed, co-created together with students. Uh, wonderful examples, for instance, uh, this one, the Liberated Learners. Um, this was co-designed by the students, the faculty and the staff at several universities, colleges in Canada. Um, and this publication or this project became the winner of the uh, last year's OE Global Award, Open Education Global Award for Best OER. Uh, it's quite a nice and rich resource. It even features playlists uh, to get students into the learning mood, for instance, and uh, goes deeper into yeah, what skills are needed to succeed in, in this day and age as a student, as a university or a college student. And uh, what I like is the, the byline is for learners by learners. So created and co-created by students for the students just like them. And who better knows what's needed and what's, um, yeah, what's valuable for a fellow student and then their own peers. Uh, so this is another way to spice up your classroom, to change the pedagogy uh, of your classroom, of your learning design and open textbooks cater to this need. They make it possible and especially the co-creation and the sharing it back into the society, into the community. And uh, not just the academic community, but beyond that, uh, this element is pretty strong. And uh, yes, this open pedagogical approaches are greatly facilitated by um, by open textbooks as vehicles of bringing the message across. So you can also explore this uh, textbook uh, as an example by following the link from the slides. And another one is also a Canadian example as well, um, also um, signal or showcases the co-creation between academic staff and students. And this one was done by um, a group of teachers together with their students uh, that spans actually two years. So it has two volumes, volume one and volume two. Uh, so the next generation of students um, have uh, also worked on the open textbook, the creating of their own customized open textbook on this uh, subject of the ethical use of technology in digital learning environments. Uh, so these were graduate students who co-designed the textbook together uh, during their uh, Master of Education program at the uh, University of Calgary in, um, in Canada. Also uh, an amazing uh, example to explore and to go and look into deeper. 
Uh, and if you're interested in this open pedagogy side of things in the co-creation with students, then I would also like, or we would also like to highlight this collection of uh, student created OERs. Uh, well, uh, they are uh, also available on other platforms, but in this case, we're showing you and linking to the student led OER collection collected by Pressbooks. Um, and it's a nice one to explore, to get inspired and to see what, what can be done in a different way. How can we go beyond the traditional understanding of the textbook? And actually will make it richer, make it more participatory, empower the students uh, and activate them and engage them more. And this can all be done with open textbooks. Now, if you're wondering, OK, that's all good, but uh, where do I actually start looking for open textbooks? Where do they reside? Are they scattered all over the Internet? Um, then our reply would be yes and also no. There are, of course, some recommended places we uh, would recommend you to, to go and look uh, into, uh, but do not stop there. Go and look beyond as well. Um, so the usual suspects, the first place um, I would send any uh, teacher interested in exploring would be uh, places like the Open Textbook Library. Um, that has an amazing collection of uh, several thousand, whoops, like over 1,000 open textbooks uh, with um, a nice feature of peer reviews, community peer reviews. So you can also see how other teachers, um, your peers uh, review uh, this or that subject based on several criteria. And another one is OpenStax, also a great resource that also offers, besides the uh, openly licensed free textbook, it, uh, textbooks, it also offers um, lecture materials, ancillary materials to help enhance the, the teaching and learning processes in your classroom. Another one uh, is a really good collection as well in several languages too, uh, is Libra texts and they also cater to the needs of a diverse audience, not only the English speaking audience, so I'd also recommend you to go and explore this. They have wonderful uh, collection of over 2000 uh, textbooks uh, of different formats and shapes and sizes. Pressbooks directory, of course, uh, many users of the Pressbooks uh, platform network can uh, choose to include uh, their produced textbooks into this directory. So it's also a nice place to go and explore. As you see, it features uh, over 5,000 uh, open textbooks from all across the world and all across different topics. Well, uh, Directory of Open Access Books, DOAB, uh, is maybe not your traditional place to look for textbooks, but it's full of really great quality peer-reviewed open access monographs that could also be used as textbooks uh, in your classroom, and we encourage you to look there as well. And uh, Wikibooks, uh, of course, is a wonderful project uh, where you could also uh, well, experiment and, and see what you can do with the open textbook format. And of course, the OER Commons and Merlot are great places to search as well uh, that might take you to some unexpected results that you might not find uh, through a traditional or traditional, more commonly used uh, repositories of open textbooks. So this is it for the overview, but we would like to uh, collect nice examples from you because we're sure you know of so many great examples from your institution, from your country, or maybe some project you've been following very uh, gladly. So please um, go to the Padlet. I will insert the link into the chat as I speak. Please go to this Padlet. Hopefully everybody has access uh, to it and there are no issues and uh, take a look and share the resource you like the most, the open textbook you would like to share with us. Help us collect nice responses, help us collect nice examples that we can further showcase to you as the community of interested open educators, uh, open education supporters as well, but also further and beyond. We will gladly take this and share this with you um, later together with the, uh, the, the, the slides, but also together with the recording. Uh, but we will also take uh, these responses and gladly incorporate them into our own uh, universities and our own networks where we are active. Uh, so please uh, leave examples. You can be anonymous. You can log in whichever you prefer. Um, because, of course, as much as we try to be diverse and inclusive of different um, countries and examples, uh, it's impossible to know all of them. And this collective hive mind, I'm sure, will help us um, collect wonderful gems uh, that you know of and we would love to learn about. So please take a few minutes and and um, let us see, let us know.
And if any of you would like to um, actually chime in and tell us uh, what's so amazing about a particular textbook or particular project you would like to showcase, please feel free to do so. Um, just raise your hand or turn on your mic and yeah, tell us, please tell us, share with us. Nice, so many amazing resources already appearing. Great, indeed. Uh, please also share any toolkits you think would be useful to anyone working with the subject of open textbooks. So not only the open textbooks uh, themselves, but also any helpful instruments for um, creating them or working with teachers facilitating that. That's really appreciated. So to give you uh, some time to uh, also fill it in, uh, you can do it now. You can also do it during the Q&A session if you feel like something just came to your mind. And I would like to uh, give the floor to Lambert here at this point. And the Padlet yes, remains active. You. So feel free to continue being yeah. active in it. Yeah, maybe. So we should use the last 20 minutes or so to uh, come back to some of the questions we already heard and checked, but maybe uh, you just came about something you want to talk about or want to ask. Uh, let me um, kick off the discussion by coming back to one of the interesting questions that I have already been asked in the chat. So, um, Ruth Marty asked, apologies if I missed this, but has the panel incorporated peer review into the production process? And I want to give this back to Mira or Sylvia, since I'm sure they can provide one of the examples where this happened. Sylvia, would you like to go ahead and share your experience with the toxicology? Um, yeah, but that's not peer feedback, that's peer uh, review. Peer review. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we exactly have this question now about peer yeah. review. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The peer review process, like, was going like a peer review process in, also with publishers. You ask some people to uh, peer review uh, your book, and um, the editor, the main editor, was coordinating this uh, this process. So um, the peer review data is collected, and then. Um, you give them the, the last version of the book, you ask them for peer review, and then the peer data is, con, uh, con, yeah, is uh, saved and stored, and then you publish the, the final version of the book. So I don't know if this is an answer or that you have a, a deeper question behind it. So please um, ex explain it to me, please, if this is, not what you're waiting for. Maybe you're looking for another answer. That's also possible. Ruth, if you like to, you can add to your question either live with your microphone or on yep. the chat. It's just yeah, happy, happy to speak if you can if you can hear me okay. Yeah, um, great, great. Thanks very much for the presentation and for addressing the question. Um, the, the reason I asked it was obviously thinking of the um, Publisher, publishers uh, argument of the benefits of traditional publishing and part of that obviously being uh, peer review in the process and that uh, that sense of uh, authority and uh, status uh, that uh, a publisher can bring to a title uh, and I wondered whether with the academics we've worked with 
whether um, that was something that uh, that came from them, uh, that sense of wanting um, validation, I guess, in some sense from pe from peers, if not through the traditional publishing process, and just if, if that was an issue and how you how you worked with that, if it did come up for you. Yeah, but it was no issue for us because the CTEC network, network is organized in a European way. So there's a big community with professionals, with scientists, and they were asked uh, to do a peer review of a part of, uh, of some chapters or the whole book. And that, that, that book is peer review published. So you can also see the persons who did do the peer review. In our case, uh, we left the choice and the decision to the authors. Of course, there was also some uh, pre-selection process to understand which authors, which projects we are willing to work with or ready to work with also in terms of ensuring some quality standard. Uh, but so far, the ones who've published uh, with us, and uh, these were mostly individual authors, um, they have not had a formal peer review process. So the informal ones, yes, of course, uh, they were discussing things in their communities and so on. Some also used uh, the peer feedback, of course, uh, a different type of mechanism. Uh, but also many of them saw this actually as not an obstacle or um, a sort of uh, advantage that, um, that commercial publishers have, uh, but more of an advantage of the open textbook format that you can be quite fluid and quite quick uh, and also quite dynamic in processing and incorporating this live peer review that happens after you publish the book. Uh, so in this case, uh, they were happy to publish as, uh, as is without having the formal peer review process. But of course, if any of them would like to go through the info, uh, through the formal uh, uh, review process as it is established for uh, other types of, say, research output, uh, we would not be objecting to that. We are uh, welcoming that as well. Yeah, we do the same thing. We leave it to the authors. What we did with the, with the 65 author book was make an Excel, make the, the, um, the topic, create the topics, divide them over the scientists, start writing, <coughs> have the first version, go to the official peer review process, and then finalize the book. But it's that is the only book that was peer reviewed published. All the others are not. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the interesting answers. Also from Boot, <laughs> who mentioned this in the chat here. Uh, thank you. That's very interesting to hear. So I think we clearly have time for one or two more questions or topics. So, um, yeah, okay, oh, oh, we use some of the prepared ones. <laughs> As, uh, but but I'm, I'm still looking at the chat. So if, if something comes to your mind, feel free. Don't hesitate, share it on the chat. You do not have to use the microphone if you don't want. So, um, yeah, this is an, this is an interesting, uh, more, more particular question. What is the state of open textbook publishing uh, of the open textbook adoption and publishing in your country or institution. I think this is super interesting because we already learned from the examples that there are huge uh, differences. So this is still an early, a young field, but uh, we have many different approaches and stages of the development in different countries, as it seems. Maybe uh, someone from our audience here is willing to share uh, in particular about their own country, which was not mentioned yet here, maybe. Uh, so um, where they are and, and what, what do they face as uh, challenges in their country in particular, or what they want to achieve in particular as their country. Any volunteers? Someone from a country who was not yet mentioned here. Okay, maybe, yeah, but uh, please uh, let, let, let us come back if, if, if something comes to your mind. So um, we still have like 40 people also here in the room as an audience. And um, yeah, maybe uh, we can go also to the last question that we suggested here, opportunities for big games or low-hanging fruit. This is also interesting. 
So uh, I, I can provide one example that was not yet mentioned. So, uh, but which was discussed uh, at our institution. And that is that uh, for open textbooks and the academic context, we have very specifically a low hanging fruit. And that is that in, in many fields, it's uh, quite common that uh, scripts are circulating at the university. I don't know if you know the concept. So teachers share what they will do in the teaching anyway, in some scripted form, or, or it's, it's circulating among students and so on. In earlier times, you sometimes even had a printed version in the university's bookshop or so. And I think this is one of the typical low-hanging fruits because this is not a really well-made textbook in itself, but it gives you a great starting point, right? So if you have the script uh, for your lecture, uh, whatever the topic, yeah, whatever the audience, you have something and you can work with that. So this is maybe also a suggestion if you look for a starting point for your open textbook journey. So now I'm uh, reading something from the chat. Um, this is again from Ruth Murphy. I'm also wondering whether the panel of wider participants think about the role of open textbook books in exploring the promotion of underrepresented voices and in diversifying disciplines and the curriculum? Super interesting, relevant question. Uh, Sylvia, Mira, or Paola, maybe you have a, an opinion on that, or an example. Well, let me let me open my microphone on this one because I just shared in the Padlet a link to uh, an open textbooks actually that was really inspirational for me, and the title is "Open at the Margins." It was co-edited by a lot of people around uh, the world, and uh, actually the the main uh, idea of this open textbook was to reflect, uh, first of all, invite authors from all uh, marginalized communities, uh, being them officially recognized as marginalized or uh, not even considered in this, uh, in, from this angle. And um, the idea is to open the margins as far as possible to include in the philosophy of open as many people, but also as many approaches as possible. And this made me change my mind quite uh, largely, I have to admit, on my previous idea of openness, because uh, reflecting on what people might feel comfortable with, with when they take the first steps uh, toward open education, they might be willing to share with a more closed license or a more difficult to adapt uh, um, template or format. But then if they are welcomed by the community, they are more willing to discuss about the different formats and different uh, um, more open licenses. Actually, this is also something that I wanted to ask this community. I was writing a question while uh, you asked the Lambert. Uh, about uh, the approach of the authors. Uh, when you, in your experience, when you invite authors to share their knowledge uh, uh, in an open textbook, aren't they frightened somehow uh, by the fear of losing uh, grasp on their expertise? Because this is something that I encounter quite often at the local level. So I was willing to know about the others. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you, Paula, for sharing. Yeah, thank you, Paula, and a really good question as a follow up indeed about uh, the ownership and the yeah the fear that your results will be somehow um, 
yeah, stolen or misused or misrepresented, of course, yes, um, we hear those voices, of course, from the teachers, mostly the teachers um, who are not yet at the level of or at the point of considering creating an open textbook. Usually those who are at that stage already have weighted the, the ups and downs, the pluses and minuses and understand, um, you know, the, uh, the benefits of publishing open, but also the potential um, pitfalls or obstacles that could be in their way. Um, so most of the ones who are authors uh, actually consider um, open open publishing and open sharing as a vehicle to spread their message further, to reach a, a much wider audience than you would have reached if you published in a different way. Uh, in this case, at least in their cases, you can always, of course, uh, find counter examples and find different ways of going about these topics. But so far, uh, the teachers we've been working with at the University of Groningen saw this as the way to uh, to share their own um, research and their own style of teaching as well, not only the material, but also the yeah, the didactic surround of it. Um, but we also try when discussing the topic of OER, we also try to bring up the indeed the, what uh, Ruth uh, referred to in terms of um, the wider participation. Um, or decolonizing the curriculum uh, to discuss those angles and um, this can be done in several ways, this can be done by adopting open resources, open textbooks that were written, uh, say, outside of the global north or outside of, uh, you know, the Dutch academic community to have more diversity in the voices. Um, that's one way to do it by reusing uh, what's out there and what includes already um, more diverse perspectives, but also by um, creating something that would already be inclusive of those voices, either by uh, well, taking students into account or involving students as school creators and students also come from different walks of life, different um, origins and backgrounds and so on, uh, but also um, doing and producing your open materials in such a way that leaves space for others to decolonize them and to um, adjust them, localize them, adjust them to their own local context and make sure their voice is also added. Uh, so I think there are very different angles you can use to look at it. And of course, there are still teachers who say, no, I'm afraid if I share everything I know, uh, my students will not come to my lectures anymore, say, or will not be taking my classes. Of course, those fears are still there. We also uh, talk them through and work with them. Yeah, the fear I, that I heard of was, uh, for example, by street law, that uh, the scientists who worked on that were having questions from other scientists, uh, colleagues around them, like, you're creating an open textbook? Oh, then it's probably not good enough to bring it to the publisher. The people are so focused on publisher's content is the holy grail and the rest, we had it the same with open access at the start. If you could not, if you were working on an open access publication, we had the same phases. So, and the time teachers have to, or academics have to spend on it. And how do you support them? I mean, fear of not having time enough, or when you put energy in this, you can't do research and pu publish in research. You know what I mean? So that kind of fear, that is what I see. Not so much about my students don't come to my class anymore because if you have a publisher's book or another interactive book, it's A or B, you know? And um, But I think we have to help uh, teachers, academics who spend time on it to support them in the best way but also with research like that is showed at the start of this webinar to work on the mindset because we are so trained to think in a, in a certain way. Sometimes it's so hard and it takes, it's taking so much time to break through that kind of patterns. Um, and then we can only start with that when we are aware of it. Yes, that it's there, yeah. I would also like to add to this indeed, um, well, in our case, we work um, with the University of Groningen Press, that's uh, a university press, a local, our, our own publisher, and uh, 
them being uh, an open access only and non-commercial publisher actually opens the door to being more inclusive and more diverse in the types of publications um, they would be accepting and giving the voice to and the platform to. Uh, so a publication that's quite niche and that caters only to the needs of, you know, as not such a significant uh, um, segment of society or academia would normally not find its way uh, in large commercial publishers or where profit is the main motive. Since uh, publishers like UGP, like uh, university presses, have that um, freedom and flexibility to be more inclusive into what kind of publications and topics they accept to be published, I think this is also a great way to address um, the question and maybe the fears of some teachers as well that, you know, um, what if I uh, would earn more or publish with a large commercial publisher? Uh, well, what if you're not even accepted because, you know, your topic is not sexy enough or is not uh, generating enough uh, um, yeah, clicks uh, because your area is quite limited or uh, is um, yeah, uh, only um, interesting to a very specific uh, audience. So in this way, we can also diversify the publishing landscape to not only let uh, the profit and the commercial motive to be dictating what gets to be researched what problems and issues in the society uh, in general get to be solved and reflected on. So that's, uh, I think, um, a way to address this as well. Yeah, th thanks a lot. Super interesting and important thoughts. And uh, before we enter the save the date stage of this event for the upcoming next part of the webinar, I would allow maybe one more question or topic if you have anything on your mind. Please let us know. Is there any more question? Not at the moment. You know how to reach us. Feel free to keep up the discussion. And uh, I think I give back to Paola now. Is this right? For, for the uh, continuing of the conversation. In the next Thank you, Lambert. Thank you, all, all of you, because it's been so interesting so far. And I'm really looking forward for the next two. Uh, webinars because uh, you might see from the slide that, that we plan to have more. For, for sure, we're going to have uh, two mm, workshops uh, on, on this series in relation to open textbooks. There will be hands on uh, workshops. Uh, the first one is going to be on the 17th of July, same uh, time of the day. Uh, the topic we will discuss together is uh, what does it take to start an open textbook pilot at my university? And this is really interesting for me, not only as a part of the annual, but also as a, an open education practitioner, because when it comes to Ignite something new, it's always a, a, a slow process. You have to uh, fight, let's say, the battle against all the fears that are filling the rooms. So it's uh, good to know that we are discussing this together. And the other one in September, so after the holiday break for all of us, hopefully, uh, um, Silvia, Mira and Lambert will help us uh, discussing how does the open textbook publishing kitchen work. So if you want to uh, be updated on those upcoming events, just fill in the Google form that I shared in the chat and uh, we will prepare soon the registration forms for both. Uh, but consider that after these first two workshops, the, the next two workshops, uh, the annual members are planning to share more. The librarians in the, in the network are keen to share their expertise and discuss with you in depth, more topics in order to help you ignite your work on open education. So uh, stay tuned. It will be our pleasure to support you in the open education work that you are igniting at your local level. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks again, Mira, Silvia, and Lambert for this uh, amazing webinar uh, and this workshop. It was uh, the first one in the row and I'm very happy to have you as our facilitators. I'm really grateful. Thanks, Paola, and thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Yes, thank you thank so you much. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Yeah.